Let me start off by introducing myself. If we haven't met, my name is Adam, and I'm the pastor here. What a privilege it really is uh, to have you uh, here this morning if you're visiting. Uh, if you would do me a favor after service, go right over here to Next Steps. Also, come forward. I'd love to meet you and shake your hand. Just introduce yourself. We are in a series right now we're calling a Second Priority, and we're looking at uh, the family. Now, we talked about our first week being... Uh, that we want to make God our first priority in all things. Our, our priorities are like this. Uh, God is first. Our family is second. Ministry is third. And our jobs, our vocational ministry, our vocation is, is fourth. And that we want to make sure that we put them in the right, appropriate order because there is power in priority. Amen. So when we make God our first priority in everything, in all things, we're not just Sunday morning Christians, we're not just Wednesday night Christians, but everything is God. When we put him first, we said this, this terrible acronym that I used, MGFP, if you remember that, make God your first priority, then everything else just kind of falls into place. This week, we are going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you want to get out your Bibles and go ahead and turn there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I was reading this about two weeks ago, and I just felt the Lord speak so clearly through it to me that this is what the Lord has for us uh, this morning. And so as we open the Word of God this morning, if you have your Word, if you have your Bibles, hold it up real high right now. Come on, this is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Let's read it together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says this. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other, and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among you, among yourselves. Verse 14, now we exhort, exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursues what is good for both yourselves and for all. I've entitled my message this morning this, Unlocking Your Family's Potential. This is part one of a two-part message. So part one is today. Part two is going to be in two weeks. Our founding pastor, Pastor Eric, will be in the pulpit next week. We're going to be looking at this week and two weeks from now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the entirety of this chapter. And I believe the Lord is going to speak to us through this. Now, if you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen and receive my notes. And what's in front of me will be in front of you. Let's pray this morning and invite the Holy Spirit just to speak to us. Holy Spirit, we are so in awe of you. We thank you, Lord, that 
You are here this morning and you're so tangible, Father. And Lord, we want to be not just hearers of your word, but God, may we be doers as well, Jesus. For Lord, we know that your word is a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. God, I pray this morning that this word would ignite Inside of us, a passion and a desire, God, to unlock our family's potential, God. That, Lord, we would be families and people that live missionally for you. That, God, we would be workers and laborers for your kingdom of God. Lord, would you just teach us your ways for we want to know you, God. We want to find favor in you. And so, Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you for your presence that is here today. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. There is some wild stuff going on in the world right now. It's crazy out there. We can see it. There are labor pains, just as we, uh, we read here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. There are signs of the times that we see and are evident for our day and our season in which we live. I think about the signs of the times and some of the things that come to my mind are Neuralink, have you heard about this? It's a chip that goes on the brain and is, in, is, is, in, is put on the brain. And so what you can do is you can, uh, if you get this surgery, you have this chip put on your brain, you can literally think as fast as your phone. So in other words, we have unlimited technology with our phones, right? And so what they're trying to do, they're starting to do this on human beings, which is just crazy to think about. They're starting to test this, is that as quickly as you can think, now you have unlimited amounts of information. I believe God's going to come back before that starts being uh, known, but it's just crazy to think about that someone's creating, uh, Elon Musk is creating this technology to put into side people. I think of cryptocurrency. It's a, it's a ledger. It's a spreadsheet, and we can, uh, we can buy and sell and trade on uh, this, this ledger that is hosted online and is secure. It's a technology that I believe will be used in the end days. I think about AI, artificial intelligence. Like you can go online, you can ask for a legal document and it will spit out a legal document for you. It's crazy, you can ask it to check your grammar. Signs of the times, y'all. I think about Taylor Swift And Travis Kelsey. (laughs) Five years ago, my wife had no idea who Travis Kelsey was, but I knew signs of the times, y'all. I'm joking. Signs of the times. Matthew 24, it says this. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you were not troubled, for all things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will be, will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Listen, there are wars and rumors and wars happening in our time. There's political division on all fronts. We can see and we've experienced to a level degree, not to a level degree as they once did 2,000 years ago, but their time is coming where we experience tribulation. All these things are labor pains for the coming of Christ. Now there's this big, huge debate around when the great tribulation, when Christ's return is coming. Many people, uh, they'll say, okay, I'm, I'm pre-trib, Christ is coming back before uh, the great tribulation occurs, before the seven years. You can talk about that, read about that in in Revelation. Pre-trib, there's mid-trib, coming back in the middle before the bowls are poured out. We can read about in Revelation uh, that that Christ is coming back before the great tribulation occurs, before one-third of the earth that talks about Revelation is wiped out, crazy stuff happening. Uh, or post-trib that he'll come after all this. And we'll experience that time. We'll experience that, that uh, the, the end of days, the great tribulation, Armageddon. 
Uh, there's also pantrib. That, hey, I kind of lean in on that, that it's all just going to pan out. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> just make sure you're right with the Lord and it's all going to pan out. I want to give you some, some definitions. Uh, here's tribulation and great tribulation. So tribulation is when you go through a very hard testing season of persecution or suffering. Okay? The great tribulation is this. is when the entire world will experience hardships, persecution, disasters, famine, war, pain, and suffering on a level never seen before in human history. So the great tribulation... It's going to be worse off, I'm not here to scare you this morning, it's going to be worse off than World War II, World War I, worse off than the great black plague that happened many, many years and decades ago. So you may be asking me this morning, (laughs) Adam, we are in a family series, why in the world are you talking about the great tribulation, why in the world are you talking about this right now? When I was reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I just felt the Lord kind of drop into my heart that we need to wake up. That Christ's return is coming so quickly. And that there are families and people that are asleep. And it's time for us to realize and understand that we are living in these days. Where the return of Christ is so near. And I felt the Lord just so strongly drop into my heart that we need to sense that and know that he is returning quickly and have an urgency about us. May we wake up, may we see, may we not have blinded eyes, but may we have open eyes to see what the Lord is doing in our time, in our season. Wake up, church, is my call this morning, because it is time to unlock your family's potential and to walk in the biblical role of what God has called you to walk in. No more games. So may we wake up and may we sense the times and the seasons in which we live have an urgency about us. And these tribulations, these things in which we experience even in our time and in our season in which we we live even now, like there's gonna be tribulation that is greater, but here's the thing, don't allow these things that are happening and going on in the world to derail you, to distract you, but keep your attention and your focus on Jesus. The author, the perfecter, your strong tower, Amen? Amen. Look at this. It says this, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. Now let's go to verse 5. This is the encouraging part here in light of these verses. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. How many of you in this room are sons and daughters of light? Come on, anybody, sons and daughters of light, amen? So then look at verse 8 here. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of the hope of salvation. Listen, we've got to be mindful of what is happening. We've got to put on what? The armor of God every single day. That we would even do it for our kids. That we put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet of peace, the belt of truth, the uh, shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, amen? Amen. That we would put that on for our kids and over our families, for God to protect. And I love this next part. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I don't know if we were here during the great tribulation or gone, but it doesn't really matter. For those who are followers of Jesus, the word is clear. We won't experience wrath to the level and degree of those who follow, who who do not follow the Lord. Now, we will experience it, I believe certainly we'll experience and, and feel the tension and feel what is happening in the world. 
But I believe that just as a verse here says, for God did not appoint us to what? To wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So because of God's great love, there's going to be protection, amen? Now, this realization of the return of the Lord, this realization that he's returning quickly, should cause us to live on mission for the kingdom of God, for our families to live on mission, for us to understand that we are laborers for the kingdom of God as well. Listen, it feels like in our time and our season in, in which we live, that people much rather be co-stars than co-laborers. We'd rather be able to post our opinions online and have a social media following and be influencers rather than be people who are working hard to establish the kingdom of God in our day and in our age. God is not looking for co-stars. He's looking for co-laborers. Let me tell you something. A ministry of tearing down other ministers is not a ministry at all. All you're doing is providing uh, division in the kingdom of God. And those people online on YouTube are creating ministries around tearing down other people because they think they're uh, protecting the kingdom of God. Listen, they don't know the people. They can't, they can't call them out. They can't have opinions like that. We're not here to do that. We're not here to divide and tear down. To cry, to cry wolf at every single thing that's said just because someone's messed up. Listen, if we were to, if we were to take this and say, okay, just because one person messed up one time, now they are a wolf, we'd have to throw out Psalms entirely. Think about it. It's believed that, that David, he wrote, the Psalms, 50% of the Psalms, this is not in my notes, but he wrote 50% of the Psalms uh, as between the ages of 10 and 14. He was a young man in the field protecting his father's sheep as he wrote 50% of the Psalms, many scholars believe. He committed adultery to Bathsheba when he was 60, murdered Uriah when he was 60, towards the end of his life. If we were to take what he did and what he messed up and just say, okay, I'm going to just ignore the Psalms because of his fall. Listen, we are all human beings. We can't sit there and judge one another. And here's the thing we look at and we're like, man, there's so much problems and issues in the world. But here's the thing about this. I look at it and in the natural, yes, I understand your thought process. But here's the thing about what the word of God says. He will build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so if God says he's going to build his church, then he's going to build his church. We don't have to worry about what's going on. What do we do? We just keep our eyes and our attention focused on Jesus. And what we do, we become laborers for the kingdom of God. Not co-stars, but co-laborers with him. That we would be people that live on mission. That our families would be missional. That we would call out destiny in one another. That dads and husbands would begin to step up the plate to offer real leadership within their families. Amen? And moms would sit there in the morning and they, their kids would walk in and they have their Bible open and they're reading the word of God and it's all marked up because they studied and they're interceding for their kids and for their family. I remember as, as a kid, um, my mom passed away when I was five and my, my grandmother uh, watched me um, between five and 13. I remember walking downstairs so often and just seeing my grandmother with her Bible wide open it all marked up and her just praying and interceding. It had a real impact on my life. I'm, I didn't have a mom, but she offered this loving, nurturing environment for me because of how she read the word, how much she loved God, and how she offered this loving, nurturing. Listen, moms, 
you can create a loving, nurturing environment in a way that husbands cannot. May you create that environment within your home. And may you even, let me take a step further, may you even offer respect towards your husband even when he doesn't reserve, deserve it. Because you can change the atmosphere in your home. Even when he doesn't deserve it, what do you do? You still give respect to him. You know the, the one thing that husbands want more than anything else, men want more than anything else is, it's respect. It's respect. And as you respect your husband, it builds him up. And what does it do? Because of the way you're nurturing and causing love with your home, it empowers him to walk in his purpose, which God's given him. Amen? So may we do that. It is, it's too crucial of the season in which we live that we've got to walk out these, uh, these roles in a biblical way. In a biblical way. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Listen, Jesus' return will come like a thief in the night. It's going to come quickly. It's going to be, we won't expect it. It'll come quickly. Like a blink of an eye, it's going to be sudden. And I have the question here this morning, are you going to be ready? Is your family going to be ready? And we can read all this, we can say, man, I, I'm troubled. Like, I don't know. Like, this is going to be a crazy season. But here's the thing in Matthew 24, 6. See that you are not troubled. This is talking about the tribulation here. See that you are not troubled. So don't be troubled, church, about what's happening and going on. Don't back down. Don't be afraid. Because here's the most beautiful, wonderful thing, and the truth is that God wins. I know the end of the book. Amen? We know the end of the book. We know what it says, and God wins. He has the victory. And so with all this, with what we just read, with what we're kind of taking in this morning, verse 11 here, we see this word, therefore. So there's a transition here in the text. Therefore. So therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. So there are three things in this section of Scripture I want to look at this morning. Three things. Verse 11 here, comfort each other, edify one another, and be at peace. Comfort each other, edify one another, and be at peace. So let's look at these three things that Paul gave this church in Thessalonica and that we also need to walk out in our own individual lives. And I kind of want to look in the context of our family. So here's the first thing I want to give you in unlocking your family's potential in the times and seasons in which we live. Number one, comfort one another. That we would comfort one another. Okay, so think about the first two messages of this series. You could really sum it up with a very popular scripture in Ephesians. Wives submit to husbands. Husbands die to yourself as Christ has died for the church. You see, for your family to reach its full potential, that's what it will take. You'll have to go low. You'll have to walk in humility. Submit. It's really hard to submit and to die to yourself. And here's the thing. Some of us, all of us to a level and degree, I'd say even, we have a Messiah complex. We think that we don't need anyone else, that we can take care of ourselves, we don't need God to comfort us. When we're going through a difficult situation, we're going through, uh, we come home from work and we're just tired and worn out, whatever it might be, what do we do? Some of us will go to alcohol for comfort. We'll go to pornography for comfort. We'll go to other things for comfort. We'll go to drugs for comfort. We'll go to, uh, you name it, we'll go to overeating for comfort. I don't know what you might go to for comfort, but if you're not going to God, you're putting that thing ahead of the Lord. And here's the thing about comfort. You can't comfort others unless you've been comforted by the one who comforts Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians here. I'm going to give you some scripture for it. 
2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of what? All comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, listen, the more, listen, look at that. The more we suffer for Christ, meaning we will suffer for Christ. It's not my notes. We will suffer for Christ, but think about this. The suffering for Christ leads us back to Christ. It's, it's in the, the pressing, it's in the times of trial. Sometimes we rebuke the trial. We rebuke the season of hardship when God allowed it to happen in his sovereignty because he wants to make us into his image so we can handle more. Listen, in the seasons, in the, in the times in which we live, there's going to be trials in our life, and sometimes the Lord allows it. Don't rebuke those times and the seasons. Come before the Lord, the great comforter, and allow him to mold you and to shape you. It's in the pressing that he creates incredible wine. Amen? So the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ, even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. In these four verses, the word comfort is used nine times. The words trouble and suffer are used six times. And so he's hammering home this point here. God is the great comforter, and we can only comfort others if we've received comfort from the great comforter. Now, if you're going through a hard time, maybe you're grieving a loss of a loved one in this room. You're going through a difficult season I just want to encourage you for a moment. Don't reject comfort from others and comfort from God. Humble yourself before the Lord and allow the Lord to bring comfort and peace into your life that only he can bring. We'll often reject it. We'll go to other things for comfort, but I just want to encourage you. Go to the source of comfort, amen? It's number two this morning. Number two which leads us to to unlocking our family's potential. Build one another up. Build one another up. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Now this is talking about the family of God. And again, I want to read this in the context of our immediate uh, family um, this morning. So it says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up, meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. I just want to encourage you this morning, just very simply, don't give up meeting together with your family on a regular basis. Like set aside time every single week to break bread with them. It's just a very simple, practical thing. Some of us in this room, we haven't met with our family in a long time. We haven't spent time with them in a very long, it's so important for us to gather with our family though. But look at this next part, and this is why, one reason why, but encouraging one another, but encouraging one another. You know, one of the best things that you can do is you can encourage your kids, you can encourage your spouse. If you haven't been meeting together, you haven't been breaking bread together, if you haven't had fellowship with one another, enjoying and and laughing and playing games, whatever it might be, if you haven't been doing that with one another, then it's very difficult to encourage them as well. My encouragement to you is be purposeful in how you encourage your spouse. Speak life into them. Speak life into your kids. Call out destiny in their life. You know, I do this. 
for my kids. Every night when I, when I put them to bed, I pray basically the same prayer that I've prayed over their life. I, I, mean, I pray other things too, but I pray basically the same prayer that I pray over their life since they were just, since they were born. I, I say, I speak and just say, you're going to be a great defender of the faith. You're going to be a great warrior for the kingdom of God. And they've heard me say that since they were born. And I'll look at them after I get done praying for them, and I'll say, look in my eyes, Caleb, you're going to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. I'll say to Ruth, Ruth, you're going to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. God has called you, he sets you aside, and you have a great purpose for his kingdom. It's not like my kids are special. I'm just saying every single person in this room, you have a great purpose for the kingdom of God. And you've got to remind your kids of the purpose that God has for them. There's going to be times and there's moments as well that you need to be able to encourage your spouse. You're going to need a word from the Lord because there's going to be times where you're going to feel like quitting. Your spouse is going to feel like giving up. And you collectively are going to want to give up. And you'll need a word from the Lord to stand on. You'll need to say, man, I know what God said here, and there might be a trial and a situation and a problem that I don't really understand, but I know what God has said about me, and I know what God has said about this season, and I'm going to choose to listen to the word of the Lord. I did this to my wife this past week. We, we, we had a chance to get away. And I felt like um, we, we were at a pastor's conference for three days, and the Lord gave me a word for her on day three. And after the service was over, I was beginning to speak it over her. Like, this is what the Lord is saying in this season about you, honey. This is what God is saying. Like, don't be discouraged. Like, keep going. This is God's purpose. This is God's plan. You see, sometimes these, these seasons, just like I said before, these seasons of trial and testing are to mold us in the shape of his character. This is exactly what the Lord does. And so you'll need a word from God at times to encourage your spouse. May you be with Jesus enough to hear the Holy Spirit. May you spend time with him daily so you know what the Holy Spirit's voice is and so you can encourage your family. You encourage your spouse, your kids, to get a word from the Lord. The last thing in unlocking your family's potential that I want to give you this morning is live in peace with one another. Pretty simple, huh? Live in peace with one another. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Ephesians 4, verse two, verses 2 and 3 be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I love that. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. What does this look like? Sometimes we need to be able to extend patience to our spouse. Patience towards our kids so that we can keep the peace within our family. You know, there's, don't we all have just little things that might get on our nerves about someone else, to sort someone else? I know I've got some things that get on my family's nerves. And what happens if we have those little things that kind of drives us a little bit crazy it's difficult for us to, when they're doing it, to look at them and to have grace does anybody else know what I'm talking about? I actually asked my kids this question. I was like, okay, so Ruth and Caleb, I want you to be honest with me. What are some things that just kind of, that I do that could just kind of drive, drive you nuts, that drive you crazy? And uh, my, my daughter said, uh, well, dad, you, you speed. You go a little too fast. I'm like, Ruth, I go five miles over the speed limit. That's it. Like, I don't, it's not that bad. And she's like, well, you're still going over, Dad. Like, I tell you, if you go over like one mile, two miles, she's like a straight edge. If I go over one mile, two miles, Dad, you're speeding right now. I, Caleb, he's like, well, Dad, you're always texting people when you're at home. And, he, and then the second thing he goes, well, I know exactly what drives mom crazy. <laughs> and I said to him, buddy, so what drives mom crazy? And he said, your pajamas drive mom crazy. 
Can you put that on the screen? These are my pajamas, y'all. I mean, the red, it doesn't go good with my skin color, my hair, anything about it. But I'm telling you, these pajamas are ugly, but they are the most comfortable things. Every time I wear these pajamas, it drives Laura crazy. I feel like her patience towards me wears thin because I'm pretty ugly. You can take that down now. (laughs) Here's what Jesus does. He gives us patience in the middle of our ugliness. He gives us patience and the merited grace even when we don't deserve it. In our sin, in our filth, in the ugliness of who we are, none of us are perfect. He still extends patience and grace towards us. You think that we drive the Lord crazy with some things that we do? <laughs> Absolutely. And if Jesus expends that same level of patience and grace towards us, we should do the same things for our spouse, our kids, our parents, and in the context of these family relationships and one another. That's what Jesus does for us. Listen, this morning, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're going through, but there's nothing that you could ever do There's nothing that God wouldn't do to come after you. Like he would leave in 99 just to come after you. God loves you so much. He would just die. He would send his son to die on the cross if it was just only you. In the middle of your ugliness and your sin, your filth, God comes and he extends all of us grace. That's what he's doing this morning. Would you rise with me?